You're listening to The Fat Cast, live from the studio with Colin Reynolds. Good afternoon. Uh, you're watching the Fat Cast with your host Colin Reynolds, and today I have a special guest, and that is uh, Elliot. Yes. Hey, I'm Elliot. Nice to meet everyone. And it's nice to be with you. Fantastic. <laughs> so now that, that performance that you just did, the music, that's pretty dark stuff. Yeah. Um, I have a very dark soul, but that <laughs> particular song is actually about the case of Lucille Butterworth. Lucille Butterworth disappeared from a bus stop in 1969. Sure. Um, and is one of Tasmania's most uh, well-known cold cases. And I'm pretty obsessed with it. So that's why I wrote a song about Lucille. Sure thing. Well, I mean, because that makes sense. And obviously, as you said, it's a cold case, so they still don't know what happened. No. I mean, there's various um, different theories as to what happened. And there was um, one of the... I work as a journalist. One of the first uh, court cases I covered was the inquest into Lucy Butterworth's disappearance, sure. um, which they decided to redo about 50 years after her disappearance because the police didn't do a very good job the first time around. And they brought in the prime suspect for um, to give evidence before this inquest and basically the story that was put to this guy was that he kidnapped her in his blue car, took her out somewhere raped and murdered her and disposed of the body in um, potentially swampland around New Norfolk. Does this mean that the body still hasn't been recovered? No, no. They've mm. never found remains. There's been a lot of searching, but they've never found anything. Well, wow. okay. Mm. It is. Did he live somewhere out near that area? Or? Yeah, so uh, Lucille knew this fellow, Jeffrey Charles Hunt, um, because they both lived in New Norfolk. Well, Lucy was dating someone that lived in New Norfolk mm. and um, Jeffrey Charles Hunt was albino and so it's kind of like, you know, remembered. Sure. And um, people say Lucy has recounted times where she saw him like looking over the fence mm. at her and stuff. 
Um, and she'd so, remember because that dude had a particular look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that explained why people thought she may have gotten into the car with him when she, he offered her a lift from the bus stop in Claremont. Um, but, yeah, they don't know what happened after that, only that Jeffrey Charles Hunt ended up going to murder for raping and murdering another Tasmanian oh, wow. person. And the story goes when he was in prison, he admitted to another prisoner mm. that he did the same thing to Lucille. And it was when that came to light that they did the inquest. Yeah, yeah. And then um, in the inquest he denied, 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 denied. Of course he did. Didn't say anything. He get, was on the stand for a couple of days and he just um, looked at a point on the wall that entire time, didn't like... Just blanked it out. Yeah, yeah. he was just like a robot being like, no, no, no. It was crazy. So it stuck in my mind and what happened to Lucille was something that I wonder a lot. So do you specialise in cold cases? No, I just I used to be a court reporter um, up on the northwest coast and probably I got into that as a result of covering that inquest oh, when sure. I was just starting out as a journal in Hobart and I covered court for about two years and that included covering some um, old mysteries like what happened to Helen Munnings. She disappeared in... I know the year, but I just can't remember right now. Right now. It might be 2009 yep. um, from Bernie. And um, she was going out with a guy named Adam Taylor at the time of her disappearance and her family thought that he had killed her. Um, and then years later, he was getting hounded by commercial um, news outlets from the mainland and felt that their approach to him wasn't very sensitive. So he decided to agree to do an interview with the local newspaper, okay. which was me. And so I sat down with him and he basically said he didn't have anything to do with Helen's disappearance and he loved her, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, yeah, that was another case that stuck out for me. So I guess I've just always had an interest in them. But unfortunately the cases I've covered have never had a resolution. Mm. So I've kind of given that up now and gone on to political journalism instead. <laughs> Indeed. So, so who is it that you work for? Um, I work for Win News. Yep. Yep. And so you're having to cover... Oh, as you said, political journalism. So this must bring you face to face with um, the politicians. Yes, it does. <laughs> Is that the worst part of the job? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No comment. Yeah. Um, uh, but look, going into the job, I always thought that I had a look on my face that people couldn't lie to. Mm. I was a bit naive. I thought if only I could be the one interviewing the political journos and if they could lie to me, then they're real, like they've got real problems. That's a real sad sort of person. Yeah. If they can lie to this face because <laughs> <laughs> I'm so harmless and like so like you're low if you're going to manipulate me. Um, but, yeah, they they do. <laughs> and so now I'm just dealing with that every day, people sort of just lying to my face, misleading me. Wow. Um, manipulating me. Uh, that's uh, the thing is now. Is it is it the job that turns somebody in politics into you know a duplicitous, you know, mm. subversive kind of person, or is it that kind of person that's, uh, that's attracted to politics? Um, both, hundred percent, mm. both. Yeah. Surely there must be people who have some kind of uh, I don't know. I don't know some sort of good ideology, right? That gets into that gets into politics, thinking, "Look, I'm gonna save the trees, and I'm gonna mm. put people before profits." And hundred percent. And in order to get, perhaps, to get something added to a bill or whatever, they have to make a deal with someone else that where they're gonna support their bill. And by the time they actually get their their moment to actually bring something up, they've already agreed to twenty things. Yep. Hundred percent. I mean, that played out very recently in state parliament with the case of Bastian Seidel, mm. a doctor from the Huon Valley who had um, the best of intentions and really believed in gaming reform for the sake of better harm minimisation measures, and he um, didn't get what he wanted mm. in in the form of labour policy, and decided. He, that wasn't the only factor that contributed to him leaving the party. There was a lot of other stuff going on, but. He left the party, um, the party caucus, and then proceeded to vote against the Labor Party in the Legislative Council on gaming reforms. Um, and that was pretty incredible to see somebody that really had these um, very strong val personal values 
and was so dedicated to sticking to them in state parliament and it's just it's unfortunate that he's now resigned and he's out of politics um, because he he said he um, he felt like a pawn in a game and he just couldn't handle that. He said that like, almost evade him those words and I was like, wow, it's true you can get real people in politics but it's really rough. It's really rough business. For sure. Now, what about Wilkie, right? For mm. years he's been bashing his head against the wall on the very same issue, mm. um, getting getting pokies out of, uh, out of the pubs and clubs at yep. the very least. Yeah. Uh, obviously that has a lot of community support, but there are, uh, the, frankly, there's a lot of people that, that use, that, that love the pokies. Mm. Um, that must be a horrible existence to love pokies, but some people just do. Mm. And, uh, for example, the last election, I mean, I feel like it should have been about housing, um, but, you know, Labor went in hard on... Pokey reform, mm. and as much as I support that issue, I think it was a terrible issue to go to the election with uh, because all of a sudden it became about um, uh, jo- hosp- hospitality jobs. Yeah. And this whole smoke screen was thrown up as in, oh, you're threatening hospitality yeah, jobs. Yeah, and that's la- what Labor stands for, protecting jobs. Right, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. Taking, taking the pokies out of pubs and clubs, that doesn't reduce uh, employee demand. Um, maybe in a very minor way, you know, maybe they have a need an extra person to take coffees around to the people doing pokies or whatever. I'm not sure, but uh, I'd love to see live music return to a lot yeah, of these venues, you know? Yeah, I was about to know? say, bringing it back to the music, like music didn't have as much of a um, prominent role in the pokies debate as I expected it to mm. and uh, very few um, groups that were very vocal on the issue raised the benefits to live music if, if they were taken out, um, which I was secretly a little bit disappointed about. Definitely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that is what it is. It was at a difficult time for the music sector to be advocating for themselves. Yeah. Like it was, um, yeah, it was just there was too much other stuff going on. No one had the spare time to go and hassle politicians. Yeah. Um, they were too busy just trying to keep food on the table. Certainly. Still um, are. If we're looking at, if we, for a moment, set aside the recent complications with live music, COVID, etc., if we can just table that for a moment, um, we're already having all sorts of issues. Uh, so, for example, the waterfront. The waterfront, we've got maybe at least sort of a six or seven venues that can easily have music Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and probably at least three or four that could do it just about every night. Um, but half the waterfront's owned by basically one group now. Is that Pub Bank Group? I don't know the name of the group. I know one of the people in the group. But, you know, rather than speak out of turn. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, let's so, not. Yeah, no, this, the same, same ownership um, like Jack Green's, Cargo's, Obar. Customs, Telegraph, Republic now um, is basically all, all over the same group. Um, in case I've got any of those wrong, mm. don't take my yeah, word I don't for know. it. Yeah, I want to fact check that one. <laughs> yeah. And um, obviously there is, at some of those venues, there is still some live music. Uh, but if we have a look at, you know, how things were... And, and, and well, there's another complication here too. Obviously uh, Hobart... Um, was just a different place before uh, we had sort of mass international tourism, which occurred, we basically had a few steps. First, Mona Opens. Um, And a couple of years later, Dark Mofo begins. And that really put Tasmania on the map, like quite literally. There's a a series of books, Lonely Planet books, 10 Mm. Top Cities in the World. Hobart made it into the Lonely Planet. Um, as one of the top ten cities to visit, and this is largely thanks to the you know the tourism work done by Dark Mofo. Uh, and at this so at this time, we've got uh, live music ramping up massively. All sorts of venues that previously never had live music started to have uh, at least you know just like some dude doing covers on an acoustic or something you like reckon? that. 
And um, because I wasn't really playing music around that time mm. when it was in the early days. Sure. Do so. You did you witness that there was venues were more willing to take on live acts? Uh, definitely, because there was just wow. more foot traffic. We had international sure. tourists coming here every day. Cruise ships coming in sort of constantly, and obviously, twenty twenty kind of changed that for mm. forever. I mean, no doubt at some point in the future we'll have a similar level of economic activity, but it's hard to tell when that might be because the whole face of the world is quite different now with the, the COVID scenario. You know, there are a number of things that happened. There was the the Ruby Princess, of course, mm-hmm. uh, in Sydney, and down here um, we basically just like shut up shop completely whilst you shut the museum down. Within a couple of weeks, kind of everywhere is shut down. Mm. We've gone into basically... Forced, not it wasn't forced. We did have a curfew, but we basically forced quarantine for a few weeks. But since then, sort of economic activity, at least locally, is basically been returning to kind of how it was before Sands International Tourism. Mm. Then there's two more events that occurred: New South Wales lockdown, Victoria lockdown. So all of a sudden our domestic tourism is now taking a big hit as well. So throughout this last couple of years, it, 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 it makes it actually difficult to judge how things might have been had this not happened. Mm. So when making value judgments about how do we move forwards now, um, we, we're still not quite sure about where we might have been. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm a muser too, so... Mm. This is a, an issue I'm fairly passionate about. I think that, you know, we need live music. We, we need it to happen. But also we need to make sure we're not getting everybody infected by, you know, a potentially exactly. deadly virus. Mm. Um, it's really hard. Yeah, it is. It is. What do we do? I mean, we, I we wear do masks we? when we're out. We get ourselves yeah. vaccinated. Yeah. We um, wash our hands constantly. And we encourage, as musicians, I guess we should encourage our crowds to be as safe as they can. Absolutely. You know, maybe I need to make a better effort with that or something as we move forward with us living with COVID. Yeah. Because uh, we had our little bubble there and things were going okay. I remember interviewing a musician through my job who said, like, I had to interview a band who I won't name who was um, popular quite quite big by Tasmanian standards and then like a really local up-and-comer artist and the one with the bigger name were actually struggling more with the lack of shows because Mm. they've been trying to tour around the country whereas the local artist was like I've been playing every weekend like just in my local area I think they're from Launceston or something so it's been we were very fortunate I think and my band the Huskies we formed during the COVID lockdown essentially that first one and we have been able to enjoy sort of like sem- semi-normal. I, think I, I, I did sound for you guys. On the, I don't know if it was your first gig. Um, or was it, or I'm wondering your second gig. Probably. Either your first or second gig. Mm-hmm. I remember it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. With the Huskies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've played there. But actually, funny, you should say first or second show because literally the the second show I ever played as a musician was at Mona. Was this – I did the sound for you then as well? Probably. This was when uh, – as IAE no, down this in the was Nolan. With, no, that was the third time I played. Oh, right, the sec- okay. The second um, time I ever played was with the Soda Creamers because that was ah. the first band that I joined. Sure. And I played keys for them. Yep. It was my second ever performance. I barely knew the songs and screwed them all up terribly. Um, and it was so nerve wracking. But I thought this is pretty crazy that for my second show ever I'm up here. It was like on the Tyrrell stage or whatever as well, which was amazing. Oh, just to quote a very well known local muse, uh, Brian Ritchie. <laughs> Who? He, <laughs> he says that one hour of performance is worth like a hundred hours of practice. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good quote. Mm. Okay, maybe that's true. It, it could be. It might have been ten. It might have been hundred, but the, the flavour was still there. You learn quick. You do. That's right. Yeah. You get thrown into the deep end, and you just got to hang. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. It comes out how you like or how you don't like. It doesn't matter. You got to keep that poker face. You exactly. Know, that's what I've learned. 
I always just pretend that's how it was meant to go. That's right. I do tend to laugh a lot when I make a mistake, though I should probably stop doing that. It makes it a bit obvious. So that mic stand falling <laughs> over, this guitar string breaking, it's all part of the show. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm known for my mistakes. <laughs> so now is it so it's just the two projects you're working on now IAE and um, Huskies? No, I do also play drums in the band The Trash Vultures. The Trash Vultures. Is, I haven't seen this band. Yeah, that's um Amy Kerr, aka Betsy Blue, um Graham from Atomic Deluxe, Doug from Monsters of the Id and me. Great. Yeah, we formed as a little band for um Hobart Little Bands. Yep. A couple years back, the last one that happened and stuck around. And how would you describe that music? Um, well all the songs are like um spaghetti western tales. Wow. So we all kind of I wear like a a, a hat, like a western cowboy cow person hat. Yep. Um and the others all wear crazy garb. And sing. ponchos and such? No, no ponchos, but crazy boots that Amy decorated. Uh, Graham does a draw on moustache beard situation and talks with an accent like, We're the trash vultures. Great. Yeah, it's Great. theatrical. <laughs> you got any shows coming up? Uh, with the trash vultures, I can't remember. Sure. <laughs> I should know this. I should look this up before I come on to a show like this. This is the chance to spruik it, but. Um, I can't recall. However, I do know Amy from the band is playing um, in Franklin on the weekend. Great, great. Um, and and how about the the Huskies? Yeah, the Huskies. Um, sort of waiting out to see how the COVID situation unfolds. I think um, tenuously arranging things, um, but like not trying to lock anything down in case it gets disappointing. Now I've seen a few different flavors of the Huskies, so. When you play it uh, Mona, mm-hmm. I would roughly describe it as uh, like punk, noise yep. type of uh, arrangement. But then when I saw you down in Pablo's. Ah, yes, that was very different. That was more of a, an almost a cappella, vocal harmony type of uh, folk inspired. Yeah, and we had Oliver on the um, accordion in that one. Oh, yes. and... And Mary, Mary. Yes. heads the vocal harmonies because we had the lovely Mary She's charming, got a great voice. beautiful voice, and mm. that was more. Um, that gig was constructed that way because of the surrounds. Yes, we were aware that we probably wouldn't be able to fit a drum kit up on there. It's plus a, all of us. There's <laughs> so. not a lot of real estate down there in Pablo's. No, but we made it work. We came up with a, a way of still making it. And like you, a, you got like, like these tiled. Walls like surrounding it, so yeah. that, like for actual for vocal harmonies, like that works kind That's of well. That's true. Yeah, I could hear everyone pretty well, which was nice, and I did like being sort of close together, like in a little gang or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a bit like you get into your spot and then you kind of have to stay in the spot for the rest of the song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like it's, it's a little stage and we were seven people crammed yeah. on this little stage. Way too many people. I can't believe we decided to add two. We took away a drum kit and then added two members. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yo. That's how it's we roll. It's getting bang for your buck. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Elliot. No worries. And yeah. keep an eye out for the Huskies and for the Trash Vultures. Yes. And, and for IAE. I- yeah. And I may have a show coming up with I at the end of January. Oh, great. So it'll probably be in a couple of days potentially of when this A couple of days from now. Uh, When we have some more details on that, we'll drop that in the comments. Okay, cool. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) 